In yesterday's episode, we retraced the route of the nine hikers on their journey towards Otorton Mountain. Weeks later, after their failure to return to Svidlovsk, search parties were assembled, and it didn't take long for them to find the abandoned campsite. What ensued was truly horrifying. The next morning, the search and rescue party made an early start, keen to determine the group's direction of travel away from their abandoned tent. They were soon joined by a larger group of volunteers, as well as members of the Russian military. Leading away from the campsite, the rescuers discovered at least eight sets of footprints, possibly nine, heading down the slope towards the edge of a wood at the very base of the mountain. Bizarrely, most of the tracks looked as if they had been made by people, wearing only socks, and even barefooted in some cases. They disappeared after about 500 metres, apparently covered by snowfall. The woods were situated almost a mile downhill, on the opposite side of the pass. At the edge of the tree line, underneath a large cedar tree, they found the remnants of a small fire. They also noticed that the cedar tree's branches had been broken or snapped off completely up to five metres above the ground, suggesting that someone had climbed it. This at first looked promising, but any hopes of finding the hikers alive would be short-lived. Early on the morning of the 27th of February, they found the body of Yuri Doroshenko underneath the cedar tree, close to where the fire pit was situated. At 180 centimetres tall, Doroshenko was the group's tallest and most well-built member. He was described as impulsive and brave by those who knew him. On a previous expedition, he had apparently chased away a bear that had wandered too close to camp. Doroshenko had minor cuts and bruises all over his body. His nose, lips and one of his ears were covered in dried blood. His upper lip was swollen as if he had been hit in the mouth. A grey foam-like substance was also found on his cheeks, suggesting he had suffered from a pulmonary edema. His right temple and one of his feet had been burned. Despite all of these signs, the cause of death was listed as hypothermia. Yuri Krivonishchenko's body was found lying right next to Doroshenko, and was discovered at roughly the same time. Krivonishchenko had been the group's joker and musician, and had something of a reputation for being a master storyteller. He had been studying construction and hydraulics at the university. As with Doroshenko, minor bruises and abrasions were found on his abdomen and various limbs. The tip of his nose was missing, possibly eaten by animals after death. A chunk of flesh had been torn off the knuckle on the back of his left hand, which was later found to be in his mouth, suggesting that he had bitten himself possibly as a way of staying awake, or if he had been hiding, in order to stifle a cry. Both of his hands had suffered burns. The cause of death was also listed as hypothermia. The next body to be discovered was that of Igor Dyatlov, the group's leader. Highly intelligent and meticulous in preparation, Igor was well respected amongst his peers. His knowledge of radio systems was said to be encyclopedic, having crafted a number of wireless devices using household items. His body was found later the same day, further up the slope, 300 metres from the cedar tree, as if he had died whilst heading back towards the tent. He was found face up and covered with snow. 
Both his hands were clasped together in front of him, with his arms tight against his chest. His watch had stopped at 5.31am. Like the others, he had minor abrasions and bruises, blood was found on his lips, and his lower jaw was missing an incisor. The coroner reported that injuries to his hands were consistent with those which occurred during a fist fight. As with the other two bodies, Dyatlov had also died from exposure. The last hiker to be found that day was Zineda Kolmogorova. Zineda, or Zina, was regarded as lively and bright by her friends. She had a natural warmth, and her outgoing personality was very welcoming. She was highly attractive, and many of her male companions privately admitted to having had a crush on her. Her body was discovered face down, 630 metres away from the cedar tree. Like Dyatlov, it seemed that she had died while struggling to make her way back to the tent. She had also apparently died from hypothermia, but her body was in a similar state to the others, with minor cuts and bruises. However, she had a fresh, foot-long bruise in her lower right lumbar region. It appeared as though she had been hit with a blunt object, such as a baton or the butt of a rifle. The coroner also found that she was not sexually active. This was investigated in order to determine relationships within the group, and whether this could have been a cause for any kind of friction between the male members. Rustam Slobodan's body was not discovered until the 5th of March. Slobodan was the group's second musician, and he always carried a mandolin with him on every single hike. He was the son of affluent university professors, and he had already earned a degree in mechanical engineering. Rustam was found face down, 480 metres from the cedar tree, somewhere between Igor and Zena. Like them, he also appeared to have been trying to make his way back to camp. He was one of the few hikers to be found wearing footwear, although he had on only one felt boot on his right foot. Like the others, he had minor wounds all over his body, but somewhere along the line, he had fractured his skull. Despite such an appalling injury, it was not serious enough to have caused his death. Slobodan also died from exposure. Dyatlov, Doroshenko and Krivonishchenko had all been lightly dressed. Their bodies were found wearing little more than their underwear. Kolma Gorova, and particularly Slobodan, on the other hand, were better dressed than the other three, although the clothing they had on was nowhere near sufficient enough to withstand such low temperatures. With the exception of Dyatlov, it was discovered that the other bodies had been moved in some way after death. Most were found face down, even though they had died on their backs. The bodies of the last four hikers were not discovered until two months later, when the snows began to melt. A Mansi native by the name of Kudikov noticed cut branches forming a trail, which receded 75 metres further back into the woods behind the cedar tree. This led to a six metre deep ravine, where a pair of black cotton pants were found. The ravine was still half filled with snow, but on the 5th of May, rescuers worked tirelessly to dig it out. The remaining four bodies were located inside, buried under four metres of snowfall. All of them were better dressed than the previous victims. It was later discovered that only one of them had died from hypothermia, and it was assumed that these four had taken clothes from the other dead bodies found near the cedar tree. Along with the hikers, they also found a hastily constructed den, which suggested that they had survived for some time whilst in the ravine. Alexander Kalevatov was a student of nuclear physics, a methodical young man with an imposing physique. He was a very private person and enjoyed smoking a pipe. Kalevatov was the only person found in the ravine who had apparently died of hypothermia. Despite this, he had a broken nose, a deformed neck, and was missing his eyes and the soft tissues around them. There was also a fairly large open wound behind his left ear and portions of his clothing were found to be slightly radioactive. Rescuers found Alexander Zolotoryov's body right next to Kalevatov's. They were embraced back to breast. At 37, Zolotoryov was the oldest and most experienced member of the group. He had seen military action on the Russian front during World War II, 
and was something of a stranger to his companions. Nobody really knew him. He had joined the hike at the last minute, but the others had warmed to his personable nature rather quickly. He had already achieved his grade 3 certification in hiking, and they respected his expertise. His birthday was on February the 2nd, and it is a particularly sad twist that he either died on or just before his 38th birthday. Zolotoryov had not died from hypothermia, but from a crushing injury to his chest. All bones in the top half of his right ribcage had been fractured. He had a large open wound on the right side of his head, a cut so deep that the skull bone had been exposed. He was also missing his eyes and eyelids. He was found with a pen in his right hand and a piece of paper in his left, but had died before he could write anything down. Nikolai Thibu Brignales was found just two metres away from the other two. Brignales had already graduated from the university, earning his degree in industrial civil construction. Though serious and extremely well read, he was the most humorous member of the group. Brignales had died from a massive impact to the skull, with multiple fractures to the temporal bone. This sort of injury would have left him unable to move. It should be noted that Zolotaryov and Brignoles were the best dressed members of the group. Both were found wearing footwear, which has led many to believe that they might have been outside of the tent at the time the incident took place. Finally, Lyudmila Dubinina's body was discovered only a metre away from the other three. Lyudmila was the youngest member of the party and was a fervent communist. She had a reputation as an outspoken and highly principled student and although serious on the surface, she had a razor-sharp wit which often kept her companions in high spirits. Unfortunately, of all the group members, her body was found in the worst state. Like Zolotaryov, she had also suffered a crushing injury to her chest. All but eight of her ribs had been broken. Her eyes, tongue and the soft tissues around her mouth and eyelids were missing. The coroner found a significant amount of blood in her stomach, which suggested her tongue could have been removed while she was still alive. Animal predation shortly after death was also listed as a possibility. On top of all this, her clothes were found to be radioactive. It should be noted that small amounts of radiation were also detected in and around the area of Dyatlov Pass. The injuries to Dubinina, Zolotoryov and Brignoles were of particular interest. The coroner reported that they did not exhibit the blunt force trauma associated with any kind of attack using melee weapons. Instead, they were the sort of injuries only seen in car accidents or explosions. They were inflicted at speed and caused by a huge amount of pressure. Needless to say, authorities were initially baffled. They could have accepted one or two hikers having lost their lives but the deaths of nine highly experienced individuals seemed incomprehensible. The campsite was examined and re-examined countless times, and from the evidence gathered, investigators were able to piece together a rough idea of what happened. Forensic examination of the fibres in the tent material determined that the cuts had been made from the inside. The zip on the main entrance was still locked in place, suggesting that none of the group had left the tent in this way. They had all exited through the large hole in the side canvas. Many of their belongings were left behind, things that would have otherwise saved their lives, including layers of protective clothing. Footprints leading away from the tent indicated a haphazard and panicked flight. The tracks initially diverged on different routes of escape, but regrouped about 100 metres further down the slope. It was determined at this point that the hikers were no longer running but taking calm, methodical steps. They walked almost in single file. Upon reaching the tree line at the bottom of the slope, it is assumed that Doroshenko and Krivonyshenko, the least well-dressed, quickly began to suffer from hypothermia. They all huddled around a hastily lit fire in order to keep themselves warm, but it was most likely not sufficient enough. They could not see the tent from their position, and it is assumed that somebody climbed the large cedar tree in order to survey the scene and see if it was safe to return. Investigators believe that three members of the group, freezing and already in the initial stages of hypothermia, 
decided to brave the elements and make their way back to the tent. The remaining four members stayed behind to look after Doroshenko and Krivonoshchenko, hoping the other three would return with provisions. Little did they know it, but Dyatlov, Slobodan and Kolmogorova would expire at various stages of their ascent. After the deaths of Doroshenko and Krivonoshchenko, and with still no sign of the other three, the remaining four members decided to head into the woods for better protection from the weather. Stumbling through the darkness, three of them fell from a height of six metres into the ravine and suffered appalling injuries. An alternative to this theory is that they all made it to the bottom of the ravine, but were crushed under a massive collapse of ice and snow from above. All members of the group now lay dead or dying, as the snow and wind howled across the slopes of Kalatsyakl. Authorities were fairly confident that this is what happened, or some small variation of it at least. However, the question on everybody's lips was, what on earth compelled these individuals to leave the safety of their tent in such a panicked and distressed state? Some event must have taken place at the campsite, which disturbed them so much so that they prioritised fleeing the scene over the structural integrity of their only shelter and of protecting themselves against the sub-zero temperatures. And this is the crux of the entire mystery. What was that event? There have been a number of theories over the years, first and foremost amongst them, and the explanation almost everyone uses to try and rationalise the incident is that an avalanche was responsible. It is theorised that during the night, the hikers heard a rumble heading towards their camp and fled in fear for their lives. However, this possibility does not stand up to scrutiny. The 30 degree incline of the mountain slope was just not steep enough to pose any threat from an avalanche, and if Dyatlov or even Zolotoryov had suspected any such danger, they would never have made camp where they did. Secondly, an avalanche would have completely covered over the campsite, including the footprints that were found leading away. The tent was only partially covered by a light snowfall, and was still standing when found. Finally, the hikers would never have been able to outrun an avalanche over such a distance. Another theory is that the Russian military had been carrying out weapons tests in the area. The Air Force was known to deploy floating mines over parts of the Ural Mountains, which were explosive devices attached to parachutes. They would usually detonate about a metre above the ground, and it is possible that one could have exploded near the tent injuring some of the hikers in the process and causing them to flee. However, there would have been distinctive telltale signs, none of which were found, despite the area being combed extensively during the search and rescue operation. Some people suspect that the group may have been attacked or coerced into leaving the tent by a third party. Whether that third party was Russian special forces, members of local Mansi tribes, or other people wishing to do them harm, this theory is supported in some way by the fact that, whether major or minor, nearly every single member of the group had suffered some form of injury, which alluded to the possibility of a struggle having taken place. Could the calm, measured paces further down the mountain slope suggest that they were being ordered to walk away at gunpoint? Again, this is highly unlikely. No other tracks were found in the area besides those of the hikers themselves and it's difficult to pinpoint a motive for anyone to do such a thing. After all, none of the group's belongings were taken, not even their money, which decisively rules out a robbery. Interestingly, Yuri Yudin believes that his friends stumbled upon something they were never supposed to see, and were killed by Russian special forces. One of the lead investigators attested that the Russian military had in fact found the abandoned campsite two weeks before the search and rescue team, and that the discovery of other tracks in the area was covered up. This theory is not beyond all possibility. After all, how can we be certain about the extent of footprints in the area, or lack thereof, when the entire scene had been contaminated by people walking through immediately after the camp had been discovered? Some suggest an internal conflict within the group, but this seems even more implausible. Why would a fight amongst themselves cause all members to leave the camp? Espionage was also suspected, with some people theorising that the entire hike was a ruse so that certain individuals in the group could meet up with Western agents and exchange information. 
It is thought that not all of them were aware of this, and that a struggle broke out when the true intentions of the trip were uncovered. But again, this does little to explain the mass exodus of the tent. A photo taken by Brignoles on the 30th of January, the now infamous frame number 17, depicts what many believe to be a Sasquatch or Yeti stalking the group. The local Mansi tribes in particular tell many legends about such creatures and absolutely believe that they inhabit the Siberian wilderness. The hikers also wrote a small article about the Yeti in their mock newspaper. This has led some people to put forward the possibility that the group were either spooked by one of these beings coming too close to camp, or were indeed attacked by one, or even several, for encroaching upon their habitat. However, this brings us back to the issue that although wildlife tracks were found in the area, there was nothing significant enough to match a Bigfoot, or even a bear for that matter. Not only that, but even cryptozoologists examined frame number 17 and determined that the proportions match those of a human being rather than those of a Sasquatch. Carrying on with the paranormal and supernatural themes, the number 9 is said to have been quite significant in this case. According to local Mansi legends, nine hunters died on the same slopes hundreds of years before in horrifying and mysterious circumstances. In 1991, an aircraft carrying nine people crashed in the same area, killing all aboard. This has led some to suggest that Kolatsiakl is cursed or even haunted by evil spirits. Did one of these spirits manifest in the middle of the hiker's tent on the night in question? Or was it something more alien? Perhaps the most prominent fringe theory suggests that UFOs were involved. Although this may sound far-fetched, there may actually be some weight to this idea. Another hiking team, just a few miles away from the Dyatlov group, reported seeing lights in the sky over Kolatsiakl on the night of February the 1st. This was corroborated by locals, who also reported seeing orb-like shapes in the sky over the same area. Mansi tribesmen would also say that this sort of phenomenon is fairly common in the Ural Mountains. A rather chilling photograph on Krivonischenko's camera, the final shot he ever took, shows what looks like an odd light anomaly in the night sky. Zolotoryov's second camera seems to show more images in a similar vein, although the film was damaged and it is hard to say exactly what they depict. On top of all this, the lead investigator, Lev Ivanov, stated many years later that the Soviet government had pressured him to keep anything to do with supposed extraterrestrial involvement out of his reports. Of particular note are the burn marks he found on trees at the bottom of the slope, particularly the tops of some of the pines, which were singed and blackened. Ivanov was of the belief that these trees, or someone hiding within them, had been shot at indiscriminately with heat-based weapons. The state of some of the bodies was also consistent with cattle mutilations found all over the globe, although this could have been down to a combination of animal predation and putrefaction post-mortem. The coroner also reported that the bone fractures were caused by very high pressure, and that even a fall from a height of 6 metres could not have caused them. Finally, the radiation found on some of the victim's clothes is also a point of constant contention, although this could be attributed to the fact that Kalevatov was a nuclear physics major. The contamination could have occurred in one of the labs at the institute before the trip even began. One thing a lot of people find interesting is the nature of the group's escape, particularly how the footprints seem to indicate that it had changed from frantic flight to slow measured paces further down the slope, almost as if the group had become entranced. Could they have been brought under some form of control before certain members were abducted, whilst the rest came to their senses and suddenly found themselves out in the cold a mile from their tent? Perhaps the most convincing theory of all was put forward by Donny Icar in his 2013 book, Dead Mountain. Icar believed that the group were affected by a naturally occurring instance of infrasound. As mentioned in an earlier episode on Kenny Veach, infrasound is an ultra-low frequency sound wave, which is said to have extremely negative effects on human beings, causing them to feel nausea, fear, dread, and even hallucinate in some cases. Icar postulates that the group became convinced of an impending doom about to befall them, and left the tent without any consideration for how they were going to survive in the aftermath. 
all they could think about was escape. When they finally realised the folly in what they had done, it was far too late. Experts in infrasound phenomena have examined the contours of Kalatsiakal and have stated that, if the conditions were just right, the smooth slopes would be perfect conductors for such sound waves to manifest. So are they what caused the hikers to leave the safety of their tent in the middle of that freezing cold night, inadequately dressed and ill-equipped in most other aspects? There are a few issues with this explanation of course. Infrasound affects different people in different ways, so why would they all react in the same way? Surely at least one of them would have seen reason. Not only that, but would the effects of infrasound really be strong enough to affect a whole group of people continuously over the course of a mile? The jury is still well and truly out. After all these years, we are still no closer to understanding what kind of event could drive so many people to act so recklessly, and unfortunately, we may never know the truth. It seems the secrets of Dyatlov Pass died on the slopes of Kalatsiakal, along with the young men and women who undertook such a difficult assignment. Whatever happened, it was such a tragic waste of life. Truly, our hearts are with their loved ones, and these vibrant and talented individuals should never be forgotten. If we are to have any hope of solving this case, we should never stray from the curiosity we all feel regarding their final moments. The sounds of their toil, laughter, and even of their horror will forever echo through the lonely mountain pass where they spent their final days. May their brave souls live on forever.